engage with the mind. We are really good at loving God with all of our heart. We sometimes struggle with matters of the mind, but that is really where a lot of the battlefield is with our students. So just baby step it along. Learn more all the time. Be ready. It will deepen your faith and it will prepare you to walk alongside a student when these things come up. The Thought Factory podcast is brought to you by Never the Same, cultivating students through biblical discipleship and spiritual disciplines using theology, community, and technology. Learn more at neverthesame.org. Well, in our last podcast, if you didn't happen to catch it, we want to encourage you to go back to part one of this two-parter with our guest, Michelle Rewa. She's talking about six foundational questions in a course that she's created and taught with students called Foundations, How Faith and Reason Intersect. So I want to encourage you to go back if you haven't heard that episode. And also, I want to encourage you to go to our companion blog. There, Every single one of these six foundational questions, there is a blog post that Michelle has written, and those are linked to our blog at neverthesame.org slash blog. So let's get back into the second part of this episode in the final three foundational questions from Michelle. One of the questions that you have can be pretty controversial about the resurrection. They all can be kind <laughs> yeah, of controversial. Yeah. But this That's one, why they're fun to talk in about. In the, the faith community, can I doubt the resurrection and still be a Christian? Yeah, that's a really hard question, right? Because we don't ever want to pigeonhole somebody and, and here's my air quotes again, judge, right? Anybody. Um, and I, I'm not trying to make that a joke because we do need to be very careful about how we uh, treat one another and where we go with some of that. I, I know that there is a struggle with where we come back to science. This all intertwines. People don't come back from the dead. And some people look at the miracles of the Bible and chuck it right there because there's no such thing as somebody walking on water. There's no such thing as someone touching someone else and healing them of an illness that they've had for their whole life. So miracles don't happen. Science does not support that. And so I can't believe the Bible. And then we come down to the biggest miracle of all, which is someone who comes back from the dead himself. And that's a hard question. So we come back to evidence. I mean, we always have to come back to evidence, not just because the Bible says so, because the church says so, because mom and dad say so, because my youth leader says so. Why does your youth leader say so? And we can't just say, because the Bible says so, even though we've talked with them about the evidences for the Bible. We can't just say that. So we need to look at the evidence for the resurrection. Now, we talked about there's a great movie out right now based on a great book about someone who basically took that question, the question of the resurrection, as a way to disprove Christianity altogether and um, became a believer afterwards because... Because of the evidence. Because of the evidence, right? So we have to separate a little bit the emotional gut response of that's impossible with what does the evidence say? What are the alternatives? If Jesus didn't die and come back from the dead, how did someone pull off this giant hoax? Where We don't form new religions around Gandhi or Mother Teresa. So why do we have Christianity at all except for the resurrection? And we like to sit on the fence on this one, like, well, maybe it was just, um, you know, his spirit came back and was appearing to people. Well, what does the evidence say, though? I mean, we're back to pursuing truth, and where does my truth come from? I, I want to know, there was something that happened, so what happened? And if I'm going to base my life on uh, this belief, I better know that it's true, and how come? And I even heard that because the account is Mary telling that Basically, he is risen. Like, I saw right. Jesus. He is alive. That the fact in culture at that time, you wouldn't give credit to a woman. To a woman. Right. Absolutely. And so that basically says, like, I'm not just trying to make up something because right. if I want people to believe this, I wouldn't have used a woman right. as the first account 
of the resurrection. Right. You would have gotten all the really high, important people to show up. And yeah, a woman would, a woman had no credibility at all in that culture. The first evangelists were women. Yeah. The first doubters were men. I have three daughters <laughs> and a wife and a dog that's a girl too. So yeah. where are you going with kind of surrounded? I'm just saying they would tell me at home, women lead the way. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. would be right. Yeah. There's a great book about this called Cold Case Christianity. Yes. And I would highly recommend that book when it comes to evidence about the death and resurrection of Christ. But you're so right. We we tend to emphasize the resurrection at Easter, but maybe we don't get into why that really did change everything. It right. changed the game. It changed the story. It verified the entire structure of the Word of God. Right. I mean, if Jesus died and just was dead, well, then he is no better than anyone else who ever lived in history. And the book that we study is no better than any other book that has been written in history. We are back to, it's just a really nice self-help manual. And I hope you learn how to be a good person. Um, The resurrection provides the basis for all of the rest. So... Can you doubt the resurrection and still be a Christian? Well, I, I don't know how to answer that. I mean... When you talk with students and when you go through this intensive course that you teach, are they giving you pushback on that? What's, what are students' general response to this particular question? Well, it's a little difficult because most of them are coming already from a faith background. I think that they aren't necessarily struggling with that for themselves, I think they struggle with that for their friends more than for themselves. I think it's easy for those who don't believe to just throw it aside. Absolutely. And not even put the work into it to Fairy study tale. it. And it's just, I'm going to put it all in a box and just put it off to the side. Yeah. But when you actually start to do the research and start looking into it deeper, it's hard not to come to some of these conclusions. And yet, as students, they're starting to ask these questions their peers are asking these questions or, or living in a way that this is not true, if that makes sense. They may, may not, they may not be asking that question specifically, right? but they're living in a way that that question is not true or some right. of these questions are not true. And so we as adult leaders, as parents even, as those who are invested in youth ministry, youth minds, it is, it is very beneficial for us to even have an answer for this, for them. Right, because the resurrection, if it's true, requires a response from me. I mean, I have to do something with that. Now, I may decide I'm going to reject it, but I have to do something with it. I can't just pretend that it didn't happen. I think there are lots of people who would rather just say, it couldn't have happened. I'll, I'll set it aside. I want to live life my own way. I want to do my own thing. I don't want to be submitted to anything outside of myself. And so we have to be having these conversations with our students. We have to help them prepare for what is coming in their future. That's really what this is about, is having conversations in the future, especially as they get older, right? And we just all agree to disagree. But, I mean, they are evangelists, so we have to help them think through these things so they have an answer for not necessarily their own struggle with it, but the struggle of a friend who says, well, how could this even be? Well, we need to provide them with some of the background to say, well, how else could have it happened? And go from there. Question five that you talk about, these six foundational questions, and these last two get really personal. Question five is, if God is so good, then why is my world so bad? It's a hard question. It is a hard suffering. If you if you look at the studies, if you're going to take time to study, <laughs> suffering and evil in the world is one of the primary reasons people either leave the faith or do not come to faith, resist faith, because they look at the world and we all know that the world is bad. And they look at the world and they say, if your God is good, I don't understand why the world is this way. I can't, I won't worship that God who allows all this bad to take place in our world. 
And the hard part about this conversation is that there are answers that are, exist when you're not in the moment. And as soon as you're in the midst of a position of suffering, none of the answers matter to you anymore. You're, it is so emotional. Like this is the, this is one of the most emotional parts of it. Someone has died who you loved. You're, you know, uh, you've lost someone and you're grieving. Um, and maybe someone who you know doesn't didn't know the Lord or refuse to know the Lord. That makes it even more difficult, you know. Or we have um, mental health issues with our students who are struggling with depression. And how come, you know, why is my why is everyone else seem to be doing fine and I'm not doing fine? Um, and we have violence that takes place in inside and outside of families. And we have natural disasters that happen in the world where millions of people are, are harmed and we have war and we have ISIS. I mean, there is so much bad in the world. And we can sit back and talk about it theoretically, just on a philosophical level. But as soon as someone is living in it, it doesn't it, it's just you're just hurt. I think we talk about this to prepare students for those times and to process what has happened during those times to help them walk through it. Um, but we have to give them some response to suffering because what ends up happening is we look at the world and we say, well, either God is good and he's not powerful enough to stop it or God is powerful and he isn't good enough to stop it. I'm not willing to worship that God. And we need to show them, like, look at the life of Christ. Talk about suffering. I mean, Jesus stepped into the suffering of the world and then suffered, I mean, the most horrible kind of suffering. So God didn't exempt himself from it. But it, it's difficult because these are conversations about free will and, and you know, very philosophical. Students have to be ready to, to go there with you. But we can't act like we're afraid of it. Or that everything is good all the time because we believe in Jesus. So everything will always be good. We all know it's not true. So we need to maybe directly deal with the things that we know that are wrong, where people are hurting. And how has God designed you to step into that and serve others in their suffering? You know? Yeah, those are those are such great thoughts. I think when we gather together in our ministries, whether it be our church, youth ministry, different settings, we tend to always focus on the upbeat, the positive. Hey, things are great. Hope you're having a good week. We hope you're lifted up as you mm -hmm. leave this gathering, whatever that might look like. But but there's something about acknowledging the pain, the suffering, because as we know in any group of people, because everything's going on in our lives, there's people there that are hurting, suffering, asking pretty major deep questions. Mm -hmm. And what you said earlier, I think is huge in the fact that in the story of scripture, we have a God who has walked in our shoes of suffering. And we know that he's done that. Mm -hmm. And that is a game changer too, mm -hmm. to know that we have a God that's not in an ivory tower that right. can't relate at all to what we go through, but he knows deep, deep suffering and and can understand that. And he even wanted to avoid it in that sense, where that suffering was so deep that he was saying, let this cup pass, because I don't want to go through right. it. And asking the question, why have you forsaken me? Like, those are some really deep soul, like suffering, pain type of situations. And Jesus endured through it, and, and he can relate to our pain mm -hmm. and our suffering and our our inability to uh, just want to go through it. It's necessary to bring up this topic. And the, another great little book in the Old Testament, Habakkuk, the prophet, if you're wanting to dig into the scripture and look back a little further before Jesus, that's a good book because Habakkuk brings these deep questions before God and there's a dialogue there and it's a really powerful little book that a lot of times gets overlooked but to me as I understand and read that book I think a great theme that would capture the essence of that prophetic writing is why do bad things happen to good people mm -hmm. similar to your question yeah the world is a bad place the world will be a bad place with or without God but the hard part is to have that conversation in a way that doesn't just make it sound like, oh, well, you're going to suffer and it will be fine. You know, I mean, that's the hard part, too. There is no um, 
five minute response to someone who is really in a place of pain or is empathizing with pain somewhere else in the world, you know, and we sometimes are so afraid to, to be part of that too. It's awkward and at times, and I don't have, I know that I don't have the right words to say. And so I'll just pretend that it's not there. And yet we know this is a huge part of people's faith journey is wrestling with evil that is in the world that we can't explain. And the last question that you ask as a one of the six foundational questions is, am I committed to godly sexuality? That yes. gets really personal. Yes. There are so many issues in our world today. We chose this question because it is very personal. It is very personal choice. And they the conversation is very prevalent in our world today. I would say that the issue for my generation growing up was the abortion issue. The issue for our students is the question of sexuality and not necessarily just the big question of, you know, that has been legally resolved about gay marriage and things like that, but identity and for everyone Male, female, single, married, straight, or otherwise, there are hard guidelines to wrestle with when it comes to God's word about what I believe and how I will behave. And we have to approach those conversations with holding on to truth and extending grace at the same time. And it's very difficult to have a good balance there. But we have to figure out ways to do it where we're not compromising either. Scripturally, we love God and we love our neighbor and we love our enemy. How do we balance those things while still saying, like, there is a right and a wrong? That It's hard. That's a really hard question. I would imagine in your dialogue with students, this probably gets very involved as students are just immersed in a culture that like you said, is changing legally, culturally, socially. Things are much different than they were a few oh. months ago, much less years ago. Yeah. And in the midst of that, what kind of response are you getting from students as you're talking about this question? Well, I think that you are more likely to have real conversations with students in much smaller settings, real conversations. So students are willing to take it all in, but I think really the conversations happen between a student and a leader that they know more than they happen in a setting like we had class a couple years ago. Now, think about it. In 2015, when we did this, um, these six questions at camp, the Supreme Court had not made a decision about marriage yet. You know, I mean, we were coming at And consider 15 years ago, nobody was even having these conversations about I mean, the wider culture was not having conversations about the morality, if any, issue in regard to sexuality. So our world is quickly changing on all levels, you know, on all levels. I think our students are just as tempted to um, engage heterosexually outside of marriage in a sexual relationship as otherwise. I don't know that. I, I think the pressure is equal. Find who you love and do what you think that you is an expression of that, you know, and as long as you're committed to each other, everything's okay. Giving the students, again, the reasons, the evidence that shows us what God's initial plan was, how we look at the law that talked about this, you know, I mean, why do we say that this guideline still applies in our life and some of the other ones don't when we look at the Old Testament scripture, how come, how come you eat bacon, but you don't, you know, that, that whole thing, but there are reasons, but our students don't always know why or how to reason through that. What did Jesus say or did not say, you know, what does the whole of scripture talk about when it comes to godly living in my sexual behavior? And are we having those conversations or are we afraid of them? And going back to the fact that these six questions are all intertwined in a sense, that Absolutely. they're foundational. So by answering one 
previous question, it's allowing you to step into another question with that foundation. And so you, you're you answering based off of some of these other building blocks. And so this question, am I committed to godly sexuality? It's looking at truth. It's looking at, absolutely. can I believe in a God and Jesus and what they said is true? And yeah. then... Is the Bible a trustworthy document right. or, you know, does it change as culture changes? I mean, there, it, it all, all of these things intertwine with each other at some level. And then it comes to, if I come to that, that notion that it is true, am I committed to obey what is true? Right. And what I love about that question is it's not centered on what we think. It's centered right. on okay, this is what God's saying. Am I going to commit to the sexuality that's prescribed in Scripture? Right. There's the three, the three kind of litmus test topics that have been talked about when it comes to, to time. And like you said, does God's Word evolve in how we understand it? Is women, slavery, and homosexuality. Mm-hmm. And those can be very controversial. I've heard someone say once that you can find for the slavery... And women issue, you can find both sides of that argument, but you cannot find both sides of the argument on mm. the sexuality issue. So I would encourage you to, to check into that. As a ministry here where we hold a very traditional view of sexuality and what we understand the scripture to say about this issue. But I love the way you approach it because you approach it just from the way you frame the question and then go back to scripture, go back to what we see God talking about when he talks about godly sexuality from the beginning of Scripture, like you talked about from creation through the laws, through the Pentateuch, and even into Jesus and his references to marriage and men and women. So I love the way you approach it. It's it's great. Yeah, hopefully we're setting up students to think through that well. I mean, really, at the end of the day, we need to help our students, students who have decided, I believe there is a God, I believe that God was... Jesus was the image of that God. I believe that he proved that through his death and resurrection on the cross. I mean, we come down to, okay, well then how are you thinking through how that applies to your life? Is it just all in your head in a nice um, compartment for a thought process or are you actually allowing that to change who you are and how you live? So those questions about um, suffering and evil in the world and... You know, how how I conduct myself sexually, those are both applications, really, of what I believe beneath those things. All of this kind of builds one on top of the other. Why are these six questions so important to wrestle with now for students? I see there are oftentimes two issues for students, and we maybe brought this up a little bit earlier. Either be confronted with alternate ideas and... And so you just need to give up all that garbage that you learned when you were a child. Or it's okay if you decide that you want to believe that stuff, but, you know, don't take it so seriously. I think those, those two challenges face everyone, whether they go off to college, whether they join the workforce, whatever it may be. And so as we look at these six questions, a goal is to prepare you to face that. Whether it is someone who is right in your face challenging you that all of this is just nonsense. Why are you why are you following this? Or whether the challenge is every belief is equally valid. Why are you why are you bothering with this? That's really the goal is to wrestle with these things now so that when those times come, not that you're gonna remember every single answer but that you're prepared to go, yeah, but, and you have something to come back to that will continue to prompt you to move forward in your walk with the Lord. Well, that's the six foundational questions. We want to encourage you again, go to our blog, neverthesame.org slash blog. You can find more information about what Michelle is talking about in detail in these blog posts. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope that this helps you as you continue your important and critical work in the lives of students. Thanks, Michelle, for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jason. The Thought Factory podcast is brought to you by Never the Same, whose vision is to see new generations transformed in Christ to further the kingdom of God. 
Learn more at neverthesame.org.